Let's check out the math practice test too. So if we have milk chocolate candies and we have 59 total candies um, and they're broken down by these colors below. If one selected at random, let's find the probability that it's green or blue. So that means it could be either color. It'll be out of the total or 59. And then we'll find green and blue and we can add them up. So it looks like we have seven greens. So it could be seven or we'll add the blues. So there's 20 total candies it could be. It could be any of the blues or any of the greens. It could be 20 out of 59. Which leads us to 0.33898, which will round up to 0 0.3390. We like four decimal places for proportions. Now we want to find the probability that it's brown given that it's not orange. So this one's a little tricky. So I'm going to take this table and think about what our new sample space is. Um, so given that it's not orange means the oranges are gone. No orange candies. So they're gone. So our new sample space is the remaining colors. So our new sample space only inc doesn't include 59 candies anymore. It only includes the other five colors. So my new total is only 49 because the oranges are not included. Um, and then we just want to find how many browns there are. So there's nine browns out of 49. So probability that it's brown given not orange, so the given just changed the total. So there's nine browns, and since it's not orange, my total is only 49 instead of 59. And we get a probability of 0.183, that'll round up to seven. All right, and then the followed by ones without replacement. So this is where we can multiply. So we can do the probability of a red times the probability of an orange. There's a little bit trick with the second one though. So how many red candies do we have? We have eight out of 59. We're going back to the original total because the oranges are now part of it. And then we have 10 oranges, but now we only have 58 candies because there's one less candy. So the total changes on that second one. And then we can just type this all at once. Um, so we can multiply by these followed by for the followed by events. And we just get 0 0.02, 337 will be 34. So smaller probability because we need two things to happen. All right, we have a table of 513 Americans. Um, I noticed that that matches the total in the bottom right. It's a total total. We're looking at their education level versus their smoking habits. So we have like two variables and a two-way table. Um, so we wanna find the college that the probability that they went to some college, so some college would be this row right here, or they smoke. So that would be this column. So this is where we have to be careful of double counting. It means it could be in either category. I'm not going to write the notation again. So it's out of 513. And then we can take the 107 and the 117, but then the issue is the 25 gets double counted. So you could do 107 plus 117 and take away the 25. That's an option. Um, other options would include just kind of adding the individual pieces. So rather than looking at totals, we could just add all of the boxes that are in either category. So 20 is part of smoking, 53 is part of smoking, 25 is part of both, so it's still included, nine is part of smoking, and 92 isn't part of smoking, but it's part of some college, so it counts in that category. And I'll show you how either way we get the same. So if we do 20 plus 53 plus 25 plus nine plus 92, we get 199 and then hopefully that's the same thing we get if we add both totals and then take away the overlap. So whatever kind of makes more sense for you. We also could take 107 and then we've counted all of those and we could add the 92 
right? There's lots of different ways to add these up. Um, but either way, we get 199 out of 513, which gives me a probability of 0.3879. So ors are either category. It could be in both or it could be in just one. Um, the next example, we have an and. And is the overlap. So and is only what they have in common. So we have high school only and smoking, but and is the only piece they have in common, which would be 53. It means it has to be in both categories. So we'll do 53 out of 513. And we'll divide. And we get 0 0.1033 for the and. And means overlap or both. Um, and I have one last question involving this table. So I'm going to um, copy the table so we can see it below. All right. Um, so we want to know if smoking and no high school diploma are independent or dependent. So the idea is, is how does smoking compare to smoking overall versus smoking if you have no high school diploma? So we'll notice that this first one always matches. It's the probability of smoking. It's just the probability of smoking overall or the probability of smoking, smoking given that you don't have a high school diploma. So we want to see if not having a high school diploma has an effect of any sort. Um, so smoking overall, we just go to the smoking. There's 107 smokers out of 513. We'll divide in a second. And then for the given, we only look at that row. So we only look at no high school diploma. 20 smoke out of 72. Um, one thing I notice is these are always like parallel to each other. Both of them are smokers out of a total. It's just the total changes. Um, so let's compare these. So for smoking overall, we get 0 0.2086. And then in the non-high school diploma category, we get 2778. So what this tells me is basically 20% are smokers, but then 27% without a high school diploma are smokers, meaning there is an effect. You're more likely to smoke without a diploma. So when these numbers are different, we say there is an effect and they're dependent. So when they're not equal, if they're equal, we say independent, no effect. So because they're different, you're more likely to smoke without a high school diploma. There is an effect, they are dependent. Do a few more probability questions. Um, so I see a table with the probability of being married, never married, widowed, or divorced, and I see a question mark at divorce. So how could I find the probability of someone being divorced? So let's check out the probabilities in the table. So let's see what they add up to. So they add up to 0 0.902, and I think I remember that probabilities add, always add up to 1 for 100%, so that's how I can find divorce. It'll just be 1 minus all the other probabilities, which will fill in the rest of the table. So divorce is only 0 0.098, because that makes the table add up to 1 for 100%. So total being 1 is a good way to check your work. All right. Um, let's look at the probability distribution. Um, that's where we have our variable is the number of times a college graduate changed majors. That's a discrete variable because it's a whole number. And then we have probabilities in the second row. So we want to find the probability that someone changed majors at most twice. So at most twice, what does that mean? It means two at the most, the two or less. 
So if we want to write it as a variable, it would be x less than or equal to 2. It just means we're going to take the 0 case, the 1 case, and the 2 case and add them together. So it could be any of these three. We'll just add the three probabilities. And so the chance that someone changed their major two times or less, at most twice, is 677, telling us a 67% chance. But in probability notation, it's 677. So problem five, a couple plans to have no more than three children, and they'll keep having children until they have a girl. So if their first child is a girl, they stop. So there's a 49% chance that happens. Um, zero boys means their first child was a girl. That's all they wanted. They stop. Um, however, if that first child is a boy, then they're going to try again for a second child. So the probability of one boy means they have one boy and one girl, and that's a 25% chance. Um, and then if they're both boys, they're going to keep trying until they have three boys, they're finally going to give up. So here's our probability distribution for them. So we want to find the expected number of boys this couple will have. Um, this is like the long run average. This isn't what happens to any one couple. It's like if lots of couples followed this plan, on average, this is how many boys they would have. So I'm going to go ahead and put the data or the variable into L1 the probability into L2, and we'll do one of our stats, L1, L2, to find the mean. So I already have the data in. I have the variable or the boys in L1, and I have the probability in L2. It stops at three because they're not gonna have more than three boys, so anything else is impossible. Um, we'll go over to one of our stats. We need to make sure we tell it that the probabilities are the frequencies, so L1, L2 and we get an average of 0 0.91903. So again, no couple has this many boys, right? You either have one or none or two, um, but on average, it'll be 0 0.903. So that means some couples have no boys, um, right? That's why the average is a little less than one, but some will have one boy, some will have two boys. This is the average number of boys. All right, let's do a binomial example. So this one's gonna be binomial because we're looking at um, pigeons answering questions. Um, and the reason it's binomial is we have n trials. So we have n equals 10, that's my n identical trials. Um, and then they get the question correct or incorrect. That's a hint that it's binomial, the two choices. And then the probability of being correct is 0.74 for 74%. So that will be my p. Q will just be 1 minus this, which is 0.26. And then we'll go and look up our binomial formula, and we'll start using it in a moment. So make sure you go find that formula in your notes. It's a little scary, but we can do it. Um, so we want to find the probability of at least 8. So our, unfortunately, our formula only does one number at a time. So at least 8 means the probability of 8 or 9. And then I'm going to stop at 10 because that's the max number of questions there are. So to plug into the formula, it's n choose x, so it's n choose 8, probability of being correct, and there's 8 times that they're correct, so 0.74 to the 8, and then if 8 of them are correct, there's 2 left over that are wrong. Um, we'll repeat that for 9, so 10 choose 9 is the number of ways this could happen. They'll get 9 of them correct. If 9 are correct, there's only 1 left over to get wrong. So 0.26 to the 1. And then for 10, 10 choose 10. Um, that means they get all 10 correct, which means they get none of them wrong, so 0. So the powers always add up to 10 in this example, the total. So we're going to do 10. NCR is under math, PRB. And so 10 choose 8 times... 0.74 to the 8 times 0.26 to the 2. Enter. So the probability of getting 8 correct is 2735, but then we also need to find 9 and 10. I like to use second enter, and I can change the powers. So it'll be 9 and 1, and then 10 choose 9, and we get 0.1730. So pause the video so you have time to type all this on your calculator. 
um, 10, we could type it all out or I could show you some shortcuts. So we've been seeing that 10 choose 10. There's only one way to make a group of 10. Um, and then anything to a zero power is 10. So to go a little faster on my calculator, I would just use a 10th power. So pause the video, type on the calculator and add these up. Uh, I'm gonna add them up and we get a probability of four, nine, five, seven. So slightly under 50% that they get, these pigeons get at least eight questions correct. Um, for mean and standard deviation, binomial had shortcut formulas. These are only for binomial, nothing else. So peek at your formula, see if you can find it without me. Um, otherwise, if you have no idea, um, the mean is n times p, and the standard deviation is the square root of n p q. So we'll just plug in. So the mean is 10 times 0.74, and the standard deviation, we'll just type all this in the calculator all at once. So 10 times 7.4 times 0.74 is 7.4. So on average, they're getting 7.4 questions correct. And then we'll plug in square root, just put everything in the square root, and we get a standard deviation of 1.3871. Five digits, one, two, three, four, five. All right, two more questions using, and we'll use the mean and standard deviation to answer them. Um, so we wanna find if it's unusual, unusual makes me think of z-score to answer all 10 questions correctly. So we'll do 10 minus 7.4 over the standard deviation. So 10 minus 7.4, enter, don't divide yet or it'll divide incorrectly, divided by 1.3871. A z-score of 1.874 is not unusual because it's within two standard deviations. All right, and our final question is expected range for the number of questions that would be answered correctly. So we've done expected range a lot. It's the mean plus or minus two standard deviations. So we'll use the numbers from up here. The mean is 7.4 plus or minus 1.387. Oops, I forgot the two. This is coming from the idea that 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. So let's double that really quick and then we'll add and subtract. So we get 7.4 plus or minus 2.7742. And then I like to subtract first just because the smaller number first makes more sense. And then I like to do second enter to get the addition. So 4.6-ish to 10.2. Um, these are number of questions, it's discrete, so we'll round within So 4.6 uh, means four doesn't make it, four is on the outside, but five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 questions works, and 10.2 was the cutoff. So anywhere from five to 10 questions would be the expected range. So we'll do the normal questions in another video. So that's the end of probability on the review, or discrete probability. Normal is a type of probability, but we'll do that in the next video.